Say hello to each other. Say hello to all the saints. All the churches of Christ say hello to you. Friends, I love Romans chapter 16. Sometimes I think it might be my very favorite chapter in the entire epistle. Now, Romans is one of the uh, longest of the letters in the Christian Testament that are attributed to St. Paul. And that's why it's one of the first that you come to after the Gospels and Acts. It's a theologically sophisticated letter, and in some places it's a little dense. It's a wonderfully written letter, one with multiple layers and themes. Some people have called it the most significant letter in the history of Christianity or even in the history of the world. And I think that uh, some of history's most notable theological thinkers would probably agree. Philip Melanchthon, who was a close friend and collaborator with Martin Luther, called Romans a handbook of the Christian religion. And when I was a little kid, my Sunday school teachers called Romans a kind of roadmap to peace with God. The Romans Road, it was usually called. Maybe that um, brings back memories of your own experiences growing up in, in maybe an evangelical church. So it was, we memorized a series of key verses from Romans, like chapter 3, verse 23, which says, All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Or chapter 5, verse 8, God shows us love in this way, because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or chapter 10, verse 13, all who call on the Lord's name will be saved. Personally, I find great comfort in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, in which Paul writes, I'm convinced that nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death or life, not angels or rulers, nor uh, present, uh, not present things, not future things, not powers or height or depth or any other thing that is created. And I know those words have meant a great deal to LGBTQ plus believers who faced rejection from other Christians simply for being the people they were created to be. So I love that verse. Romans is an important and influential piece of work, but I can't say that I've heard very many sermons over the years on Romans chapter 16, the last chapter of the letter. And maybe that makes sense to you. Maybe as you listened to me read most of that chapter a minute ago, you were wondering, what is she gonna try to do with this? exactly. And maybe you're asking yourself, why on earth is this her favorite chapter of Romans? And I think those are fair questions. Now, when Paul wrote this letter, he had never visited the church in Rome before. He was not the founder of the church that gathered in that city. And maybe that's why his language is so careful and so systematic and multi-layered. He was essentially trying and, and lay out the core of his message, the good news about Jesus, for a group of people who hadn't really gotten to know or work with them yet. So much of Romans reads like a kind of doctrinal thesis, and so many readers of the letter have treated it exactly that way. But then, as things draw near a close, the tone shifts. The language becomes different, and the letter takes on a warm, personal tone. Now, even though Paul had never visited the church in Rome at that point, he knew a lot of people there. And so here at the end of the letter, he dedicated some time and some space to simply saying hello, to greeting a number of people who were special to him, people with whom he'd made memories, people who had been with him through thick and thin, people who had laughed and cried with him, people who had helped him in the past, people without whom he couldn't have done all the good work that he did. Now those stories are hiding just beneath the surface of this passage that <clears throat> to so many of us just kind of looks like a long list of names. You know, the scriptures are actually full of lists of names. If you were to take out a Bible and start to flip through it, it probably wouldn't take you very long to land on a list of names. In fact, I, I'm sure a lot of folks, when they try to read the Bible cover to cover, they get bogged down there in Genesis with a long list of names that are genealogies, like Azor begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliud, and Eliud begat Eliezer, and Eliezer begat Mathen, and Mathen begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph. And Joseph was the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. That's a pretty important list, but 
It's not something that we pay a lot of attention to. I don't think anybody, if you ask them what their favorite verse was, would, would list a, a verse or two from a genealogy in Genesis or in the Gospels. And then there are other lists. There are lists of kings. There are lists of priests. There are lists of other officials and, and kind of significant people. There are lists of people who showed up on important days. There are lists that are basically just census data. There are lots and lots of lists of names. Now, whenever I come across one of those lists, as I make my way through the unfamiliar, often hard to pronounce names like Aris, Ar Ar Aristobulus, there, we got it. Especially when I come to that list at the end of Romans, I begin to wonder to myself, who were these people? Which of these people had the most infectious laughter, I wonder? Which person brought the favorite dish to the common meal when the saints ate together? Which one brought the best wine to communion? Which person always spoke up, even if it wasn't the best time to open their mouth? And which person hardly ever spoke up, but always seemed to have just the right thing to say? Which two people became an item after meeting in a house church? Did that ever happen? I wonder. I'm sure it did. Which person said the most meaningful public prayers? Which person did everyone count on to sort of settle things out and even things up when the collection was a little bit short? Which person got the privilege of reading out loud whenever a new letter arrived? Which person comforted the loved ones of those who were thrown in prison? Which person was really great at looking after the sick? Which person had extra space and an open heart and always took in people who had nowhere else to go? Which person always did their best to make the new believers feel at home? Which person greeted folks at the door and always gave the most tender holy kisses? You know, that idea sounds totally foreign to us during this pandemic. Greet each other with a holy kiss. Not these days. Which person was pained by the fact that their family hadn't become believers? Which person was always more excited than anybody else when Easter Sunday arrived? Which person had the loudest singing voice? Which person taught the new believers the beautiful mysteries of faith? So here's this long list of names, and then here's this long list of questions, and there's not really a good way to bring the two together. We can't do much more than speculate all the while acknowledging that in a way we may never fully understand, we are here today because they were there back then. We are here today because they were there back then. Now that's the thought. That's the idea that I try to hold kind of like a precious treasure whenever the calendar turns over to November the 1st. Because today, as we've been reminded already, in many corners of the church, it's a special and holy day called All Saints Day. Tomorrow there's a similar day. Many Christians will observe a day called All Souls Day. Now for many of us, the particular traditions surrounding the veneration of saints is a little bit foreign to us. Whenever I read the news about new figures being elevated to the official status of sainthood, as the Catholic Church has done for people like Mother Teresa and Archbishop Oscar Romero and Cardinal John Henry Newman in recent years, it's, it's kind of like I'm listening to a beautiful language being spoken, but it's a language I don't really speak or understand myself. And even though that's the case, I believe that these holy days of all saints and all souls are important. I believe they matter for us. I believe that they need to be marked. Now, I believe that these days matter because they are days for us to look back at our stories in much the same way that we can look back at the stories behind the names in Romans chapter 16. These are days for looking back at our stories and considering our own lists of names. These are days for considering those names of people that we know well, and people that we barely know at all. And these are days for giving thanks as we confess that yes, we are here today because they were there back then. Now, if that's what All Saints Day calls us to do, 
I hope that you'll spend some time today listening to that call. Think about the good and gracious people that have helped you become the person that you are. Think about all the folks who could be included on your list of names. Maybe think about the folks across history, pe people you didn't know personally, like the faithful people who helped establish a Baptist congregation in Jamaica Plain something like 178 years ago, if my Google search is correct. My guess is that if social distancing weren't in effect and you could gather in your church building, you could find something somewhere, a book or a plaque or some other artifact that listed some of those names. We are surrounded, friends, by lists of names in our Bibles, on the walls of our buildings, in our newspapers, our news feeds, our phone contacts, our social media followers. So many of those people, living and dead, have helped make us who we are. In the sermon that I shared uh, last week with the good people of Windermere United Church in Toronto, I made reference to a video I've seen on YouTube. It's a video of Reverend Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood fame, accepting a Lifetime Emmy Award way back in 1997. Now, that clip got almost three and a half million views, so maybe you have seen it too. In that clip, and in that award speech, Mr. Rogers invited an auditorium full of TV stars and, and who knows how many other people watching at home to simply take a few seconds and think about all the people who have loved you into being, he said. In other words, he was calling on folks to make a list of names. Names of people who have been signs of God's grace. Names of people who've given us a boost when we needed it. Names of people who have inspired us when we were feeling lost or low or cynical. Names of people who have paved the way for us. Of people who have faced hard obstacles so that our pathways might be just a little less obstructed. It's sort of like Paul was saying when he said, say hello to all the saints. Like Mr. Rogers in his lovely Emmy speech, All Saints Day invites us to name the people, known and unknown, notable and ordinary, near and far, now and them, whose lives of faithful love somehow, in some way, contributed to our being. To list the people who have been tangible reminders of God's all-surpassing love for us. And then this day invites us to say, with a prayer of thanksgiving and praise, we are here today because they were there back then. Let's pray together. God, we offer you thanks for that whole host of ordinary saints who have helped to love us into being, for the ones who've shown us grace and made our pathways clearer and brighter Help us to hold them like precious treasures in our hearts and to faithfully and lovingly pass along the gifts that they have shared with us. This we pray in the name of Jesus, the full embodiment of your sustaining love. Amen.